you have my heart and I will search for yours Jesus take my life and lead me on oh, Lord you have my heart and I will search for yours bless me be to you a sacrifice Lord, we seek your face. We seek your presence in our lives, Lord. God, we are thankful that you said that your spirit would bear witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We can know that we are born again through faith in the blood and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We can be filled with your spirit. The gifts of the spirit can flow and work in our lives. You have not changed. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. God, you've also given us all the signs, all the prophecies to let us know that we're in the season of your second coming. And we pray, God, that you would help us to prepare to be ready in every way because we know things are going to move quicker and quicker as we move along here. We ask for your anointing today, your presence today. Again, I ask you to Touch those that are here and those that are watching and listening with the power of your spirit, Lord. Open ears to hear and understand your word today, your truth and the message that you have for them. And Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated this morning. I want to welcome everyone. Welcome those watching and listening out there all over the place. Good to see everybody today. Um, just quickly, I feel like I'm supposed to do this first before we get into the Word. Um, can we put up the Skyfall? I want to, uh, I normally do this at the end of the service, but I just felt like I'm supposed to do it at the beginning because we're a month away, so we want to encourage everybody, uh, don't miss this. It's going, to be, uh, it's going to be good. Things are starting to come together, um, and I'm really, really excited. Now, I've got a month to get all my stuff ready because I'm not ready at all. 
but uh, I think most of our other speakers are ready to go. But we're also going to have uh, more worship time, more ministry and prayer time. Uh, we're not going to be as speaker focused one after the other after the other. It's going to be more more ministry time. So that's why I didn't. I did not ask as many speakers this year. So we're just going to take our time. We're not in a hurry, and that's why I believe God moves in in a special way. So uh, I know some of you may be on the fence about coming to Skyfall from all over. Well, we want to encourage you, get off the fence. Come on. You'll have enough time to get back home before the election So, because uh, uh, chaos may ensue. So it's perfect. You can come to Skyfall and then get on the plane or <laughs> back in your car and get back home and go vote and then uh, get ready. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, I want everybody this morning, I want you to take your Bibles and go ahead and turn to Ezekiel chapter 33. We're going to start there first and you guys can get ready with the first title slide I have for you guys this morning. Um, you know, the Lord, he... Uh, when he called me to the ministry 37 years ago, matter of fact, it was June 1987, so we're talking about 37 years ago, um, he used both the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1, because I was 19 years old, and Ezekiel, some of what I'm going to read to you right now, Ezekiel, uh, when he called me to the ministry, and one of the things, if you... You can flip to it if you want to, but in Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel said he saw the heavens open, and he saw the glory of God. And so when God called me in 1987, uh, that was in June, and uh, I came back to Jesus fully, repented of my sins, and God began to show me, uh, starting in about, I guess it was in October of that year, that I was called uh, to the ministry and that I was called to be a prophet, and he did that by opening. I literally saw heaven open. I had an open vision of Jesus standing before the glory of the Father in heaven and the doves uh, of the Holy Spirit's wings stretched out. The glory was so strong and the power was so strong when I had this vision that I thought the rapture was happening because, of course, I didn't know the truth then. And... Um, but I thought Jesus was coming. That's how powerful it was. And in fact, the power and presence of, of the Lord was so strong that I had to tell him at one point, I think you need to ease off a little bit because my body's about to not be able to handle it. Now, anybody that thinks that's strange does not know the Bible. Because in Acts chapter 2, God said in the last days, he would pour out his spirit on all flesh. He said, your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, and your old men will will dream dreams, and those are prophetic dreams. And he went on to say that it would be primarily about there would be blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. Now, that's in Acts 2, and it's in Joel 2, if you want to check me, but I'm just giving you a little introduction. So he was talking about our sons and daughters and young men and old men seeing visions, hearing from the, the Lord prophetically, and also women as well, hearing from the Lord prophetically, about the things that would be coming on the earth in the last days. Now, I can just tell you that I have no doubt, after walking with the Lord all these years, that we are living in the last of the last days. Now, nobody knows exactly how long we have left. I don't know. Now, it's interesting. There have been times that the Holy Spirit's come on me. I remember when I was pastoring a church in Montgomery back in the mid-'90s, I, and I remember somebody around 97 asking me the question, when do you think these things are going to really start happening, like the big things the, that we see in the Word of God? And I said, well, I said, I really feel like it's about 20 to 30 years. Well, do the figuring right there. 20 years would take us from 97 to 2017, and then 10 more years after that takes us to 2027. And we're right here in the midst of it, and I really want to tell you I feel very strongly that the next few years, particularly 2025, 2026, 2027, are going to be different than we've ever experienced in the world, probably since World War II. And um, the evil people in this world are 
moving quicker. They're becoming more desperate. Um, and Satan is really, really, uh, I guess he's sensing he has a short time. You know, as it says in Revelation 12, he will sense that he has a short time, so he will come down to us with great wrath. So that is where we are. Now, um, again, I'm, I'm a little different because I know some people say, well, we got all these different voices, and I know there's all kind of different people with all kind of different opinions, and I really don't care. Um, I have to do, and I do, what God has called me to do, and what God has revealed to me, I share with you. And that's, that's what we're supposed to do. I mean, that's what Jeremiah did. That's what Ezekiel did. Uh, every prophet just said, here's what God's given me. You guys got to figure out whether you accept it or not. But I'm going to tell you that um, these things are going to happen. Right? We don't have 50 more years. We don't have 100 more years. That kind of nonsense. And we're certainly not in the millennial reign like these crazy people think that we are that we they think jesus came in 70 a.d and all that preterism nonsense it's it's to me i i'm i'm blown away because the things that are in here all these things that we're going to talk about they precede the second coming of jesus and he has not his second coming has not happened and let me just go on ahead and say at the outset the things i'm telling you today and i've preached on and taught before that i the Bible does not teach a pre-tribulation rapture, like we're getting out of here before these things happen. Now, I know most of you were taught these things, taught that doctrine, so was I. But the Lord woke me up to the truth by simply making me fast for seven days. And then at, on day five of a seven-day fast, he said, read Matthew 24. And I read Matthew 24. And Matthew 24, we're going to read a verse in it in a minute, but Matthew 24 is real clear. They asked Jesus, what would be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus said, well, these things are going to be the beginning of sorrows. He said wars and rumors of wars, right? Famine, pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places. He said, these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, the word sorrows there means like uh, travail upon a woman with child, meaning that it's going to be, uh, you know, it starts out slow, and then it gets more intense, and the intense uh, contractions begin to get closer together, and that's what he said, that it'll start out slow, and then things will move very fast. Um, and Matthew 24, Jesus was clear. He said, these are the beginning of sorrows, then this will happen, then this will happen, then this will happen. If you go all the way through it, he even says, verse 21, then shall be great tribulation, such as there never was since there was a nation. He says, false Christ and false prophets shall rise and deceive many, right? Do great signs and wonders, verse 24. Throughout this whole chapter, this outline of major events leading up to his second coming, you do not hear him mention the rapture of the church until verse 29. Go ahead and put verse 29 up. For, through 31, he says this, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. That's the firmament will be shaken and rolled back. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall the tribes of the earth mourn, for they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to another. Now, it's as plain as the nose on your face. He tells us when he's going to gather his elect. And some people say, oh, the elect means the Jews. No. Almost every time, I think it's eight, nine, ten times the word elect is used in the New Testament. Uh I think seven or eight of them refer to the church. In fact, the Apostle John calls the church the elect lady. All right? So the church does not leave here. So you need to understand you will be here. I really believe, unless you die soon, you're going to see the things that I'm going to talk about. All right? Now let's go back to Ezekiel 33. And we're going to start at verse 1 and read some stuff here. Got a lot to cover this morning. Ezekiel 
He says, and again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, when I bring the sword upon the land. Now, when he's talking about bringing the sword, he's talking about war coming to the land. He says, when I bring the sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman, and if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people. Then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him, but he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, He is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So thou, son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. Now this is something the Lord spoke to me many years ago, that I would be a watchman to give warning to the people. Now, Jesus said this. He said, that we will hear of wars and rumors of wars. And we can go ahead. I did a sermon probably in 2019 entitled Wars and Rumors of War. But today we're going to do Wars and Rumors of War 2024 because this is kind of an update. Because everything that I've talked about, 2019, 2018, going back into even many years ago, these things have been brewing but now they're starting to, uh, to boil. They were simmering. Now they're, they're in full boil, okay? And it's not any of this by accident, okay? Because this stuff is rolling. Now, you guys can put up the, uh, the PowerPoint from 2019. I'm going to use it a little bit here because I need to explain some stuff. So everybody knows about the Ukraine-Russia war going on right now. And also what's going on with Israel and Hezbollah, which Hezbollah is a terrorist group based in Lebanon, but they are funded and supplied by Iran. So uh, basically right now Israel is in the beginning of a proxy war between them and Iran, and this is going to uh, escalate. Let's just go here. Of course, this is the verse, Jesus said, you shall hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you be not troubled, for all things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And of course, this was back then, this was uh, October 8th of 2023 here, Israel's at war with Hamas, unprecedented attacks. So this stuff, again, has been brewing, but uh, after Israel used pagers and walkie-talkies to explode and kill a bunch of Hezbollah leaders. Now they are all turning it up a notch. So in the next, probably the next week and the next weeks to follow, this thing's going to escalate. And when it goes full-blown with Iran, just know that Israel has made it very clear that they will not hesitate to use nuclear weapons against Iran if they feel threatened to the point of being overwhelmed or hit with rockets or any type of weapon of mass destruction. Um, Now, the Bible foretold this, and I want you to get ready. We're going to turn to this. The Bible foretold what we're about to see happen. Now, Ezekiel, let's go to Ezekiel 38. So you just got to flip over a few chapters. Now, this is something my church ought to know because I've preached on this quite a bit. But the Lord is like, you need to give this update because it's, it's coming quickly. Now, Ezekiel 38, we're going to start reading in verse 1. He says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog in the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. I say, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against thee, O Gog, and the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, and all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, 
even a great company with buckler and shields, all of them handling swords, Persia, which is Iran, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togarma of the north quarters and all his bands, and many people with thee. Be thou prepared and prepare thyself for all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. After many days, now this is the key, that this, when Ezekiel was prophesying this, he let us know that it wasn't for that time. He says, after many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years, thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Now, before I keep, this is an important passage here because this again foretold the regathering of Israel to the land. Now, I've shared this many times. You can check me on this, but Isaiah 11, Isaiah prophesied long before the Babylonian captivity. He said that Israel will go into captivity two times and be brought back out of it two times. The first time happened under Nebuchadnezzar, and that was during the days of Jeremiah and Ezekiel. They were 70 years in captivity in Babylon. Then God brought them back to the land. This particular passage here, he's not talking about that first time. He's talking about the second time because remember the context. He says, in the latter times. If you look that up in Hebrew, he means the last days. He's saying, in the last days, I'm going to gather this people. They're going to dwell safely in the land. And then you, Gog and Magog, and all your bands, this coalition, are going to come against them. I'll come against the mountains of Israel. Here's what's interesting. He's talking about this massive army coming against Israel. And he says, verse 9, thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Now, this is before airplanes. He was foretelling that they would come primarily in the air like a storm. Now, that's pretty amazing considering that this was about 2,600 years ago. And that's exactly how armies come first, right? By air. When they're invading. And even if they do have a massive infantry movement, it's just like we did when we invaded Iraq or when we did Desert Storm. First Desert Storm was Desert Shield, and we had to move all of our soldiers and equipment and everything into place, and then we invaded. But all of that was done by air and by sea, right? Now, he goes on to say, verse, we'll read verse 9, Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land. Thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. And thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass at the same time Shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages, and I will go to them that are at rest. Well, let me just show you something. When Israel came back the first time from Babylonian captivity, they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. When they came back the second time, they didn't rebuild any walls for defense. Right? They don't have walls around the whole nation of Israel. Now, yeah, they built a wall between them and Gaza, but they don't have walls around every city or village. That's why he's saying they are the land of unwalled villages. And he says, and I will go to them that are at rest and dwell safely of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. And then he says, this, this is coming into the mind of God, to take spoil, to take prey. And then he goes on to talk about Sheba and Dedan and Tarshish. Now, let me just break it down for you. We're going to go through this a little bit so uh, nobody gets uh, discouraged because a lot of people have different ideas. Oh, Gog and Magog is this or that. No, we go by what history tells us, okay? And we're talking about ancient history. Now, this is your basic map, and it's interesting what's going on here. You notice that where it's Scythia is there? What is that right now? Ukraine and Crimea, right? But what, what happened was there was a migration up above the Black Sea of these people called uh, by Josephus, and I'm going to show you, Josephus called them, he said, the Magogites, 
he said, migrated up what, north of the Black Sea, and the Greeks called the Magogites the Scythians. Okay? And the Scythians became the foundation of what became Russia. All right? Because actually, what is that land up there above Ukraine? All these Scythians migrated north and to the east and to the west and became the Russians. Now, the Russians admit this and know this. But isn't it interesting? The Bible talked about Gog and Magog. And the, the first migration of the Magogites called the Scythians by the Greeks ended up in the Ukraine, Crimea area. And this is going to be one of the places that takes peace from the earth. All right now, let's keep going here. Just to show you, this is 1874 map. We're talking about Meshach and Tubal, right there. Togarma. This is Turkey, Gomer. So Turkey's going to be involved. It said Ethiopia, Libya, Persia. These are the people. Now, what is what do all these nations have in common with Russia? The ancient Scythians. What do they have in common? All those nations mentioned. Iran. Ethiopia, Persia, what do they all have? A high population of Muslims that hate the nation of Israel. And he said, you're going to come, all these nations are going to gather together with Russia. Well, guess what? Russia and Iran are allies, big time allies. So what do you think is going to happen when Israel finally has to obliterate Iran. There's been a plan in Russia for a long time to move south all the way to Israel. Let's keep going. Now, ancient history. This is what I mentioned a minute ago. I'm going to give you the, I have it in my office. I've had it for goodness, over 30 years, but the complete works of Josephus. He was the first century Jewish historian and, of course, well, known, well accepted as one of the most accurate and trustworthy historians of all time. And he says here, he says, after they were dispersed abroad in account of their languages and went out by colonies. And he's talking about when God at the Tower of Babel dis dispersed them, right? And they became the nations. That's actually Genesis 10 is what he's referring to, the table of nations, how they all began to form. He said, Magog founded those that from him were named the Magogites, but who are, who are by the Greeks called Scythians. Everybody see that. The Encyclopedia Britannica says the Scythian is a member of a nomadic people originally of Iranian stock who migrated from Central Asia to Southern Russia in the 8th and 7th centuries. The Scythians founded a rich, powerful empire that survived for several centuries. Well, it may have ceased being Scythian by name, but it became Russia. Now, Russia is very proud of this. They do not hide this. Joel C. Rosenberg, who's a Christian, but he's also a Jew, an Israelite, he says, and this was confirmed by the New York Times bestselling author Joel C. Rosenberg when he was in Russia in 2004 doing research uh, for his book, The Ezekiel Option. He said, so while we were in Moscow, we turned the toured the State Historical Museum, sure enough, as we spent several hours walking the floors of the enormous red brick building facing Red Square, we found in glass case after glass case numerous Scythian artifacts dug up by Russian archaeologists and anthropologists, all on display in the Russian equivalent of our Smithsonian. Not only was the, Rus was the uh, Russia Scythian heritage real, as we learned, but the Russian government was proud to let the whole world know. So there is, to me, no dispute over who Gog and Magog is. Gog is just the chief prince of whoever Magog is. Well, Magog became the Scythians who became the Russians, and they migrated north of the Black Sea, which is Russia. All right? Now, does everybody get that? Now, we talk about this war that's coming, and the Bible foretold this. Now, I did a... Uh, a message that I have done, I did it the first skyfall, and I've done it over the years about the seven trumpets. I'm not going to repeat that today, but I want to I share something about that seven trumpets. 
See, I believe, and I teach in that message, that I believe five of the seven trumpets have already blown. And I can prove it. I'll give you an example. The second trumpet says, in fact, well, let's just turn there. Uh, turn to Revelation chapter 8. We're just going to teach a little bit today, I guess. Take our time. We're not, uh, we don't give sermonettes for Christianettes here. We study the Bible a little bit, all right? Now, I want to go down to the second angel, which is verse 8. So, Revelation 8, verse 8. And I don't have time to develop all this for you, but if you want to put up the seven trumpets uh, PowerPoint for them real quick, they can, we can go through some of this quickly. I think somebody needs to see this for some reason. Um, I believe the first angel that sounded uh, these trumpets, I, and the Lord confirmed this to me. I, I'll, I'll share a little bit about that in a minute, but... The second trumpet is interesting because the second trumpet says the second angel sounded as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea and the third part of the sea became blood and the third part of the creatures that were in the sea that had life died and the third part of the ships were destroyed. Now this is very important. So you guys let me know when you get it up here. Um, I believe this was World War II. You're going to say, well, why do you believe it was World War II? Well, I'll tell you why. Because... It's very specific there about a third of the ships being destroyed. And it's very specific about this. He, what John saw, he said, I saw a mountain of fire fall into the sea. So we got two things that are very clear. And then, of course, the a third part of the creatures in the sea dying, and I'll address that. Um, did you find it? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. All right. I'm going to skip down. Maybe I am. I'm putting a lot of pressure on them today. They're doing good. All right. Not yet. It will in a second. Maybe. Go to the second uh, trumpet there. I think I started with the third, so you'll have to go. There we go. World War Two. All right. So is it going to work for me? There we go. So, of course, World War II, one of the things it was known for was its unprecedented naval battles and the amount of ships that were involved in the war. It's never happened before or since like this with the navies of the world. Um, as you can see, there were many, many naval battles, many, many ships sunk. Um, I did the calculations. You can start calculating this and counting it up for yourself, but I'm going to do you quick for you. We're going to skip over here. I went to studying all this about the shipping and all the stuff that was destroyed. You can see I did my research. I'm going to skip through those. So it's been estimated that there were 105,127 ships involved in World War II. And exactly, get this, how many were destroyed and sunk? 36,387. If you do the math, it's 0.34. What is one-third? 0.33, right? So one-third of the ships were destroyed in World War II. What would be the burning mountain? All right. What would be that burning mountain, you think? Maybe the first use of the atomic bomb that was dropped on a small island out in the sea. Two of them. And then what followed this event? What followed it? After the first atomic bombs were dropped, guess what happened? The United States, Russia, England, France all began doing something. As they began to develop their nuclear weapons, they began testing them where? In the ocean, under the ocean. I wonder if they destroyed maybe a third part of the sea creatures through that. Okay, this is why I believe these things. Now, there's much more to this. We could go through Chernobyl, which is interesting. Let's back up. I think it was back when I did. Yeah, I'm going to go back to Chernobyl just to prove what I'm saying here. All right, there we go. All right, let me back up. All right, 
I didn't plan to do this, so. Here's what's interesting about this. So, man, I didn't realize I put all this extra stuff in there. Whew. Y'all are getting to see it all there. All right, well, let's just do this. If you look at it, the third trumpet, let's just read it first. And he said, the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Now, if the second trumpet was World War II, which ended in 1945, then the third would come after that, right? Stands to reason. So 1986, we know about the Chernobyl disaster. Now, what's interesting is that, do we have it back up there? Let me go down here. Let's see where it is. This is all the information on it. Well, I guess I didn't have that slide in there. Anyway, the, uh, the word wormwood's interesting because where did this happen? And this is another interesting thing. Where did this happen? Do anybody remember where Chernobyl is located? Pripyat, Ukraine, yes. Right? Now, what happened there was interesting because the worst nuclear disaster that we've ever had, the radiation went up, and the bad thing that happened was clouds formed and there was a storm and rain began to fall. So all that radioactive, uh, I guess, contaminants got into the air, got into the clouds, and then got into the rainwater that went and spread all over. In fact, the radiation went as far as uh, Europe contaminating farms in Wales. It's, it's said, estimated about 17 million people were affected. Many people died because of the radiation. I mean, we could go through all that. But the most interesting thing about this, why do you, th you say, why do you think that Chernobyl was wormwood? Because in the Ukrainian Bible, if you picked up a Ukrainian Bible and opened to this where it says wormwood, for our English, it would say Chernobyl. The actual word Chernobyl is there. All right? And Chernobyl is spelled very similar both in Ukrainian and in Russian. All right? It's clear Chernobyl. So uh, another interesting fact is that the Ukrainians also believe. Let's see. Where is it? Let me go. I'll go back to it. The Ukrainians also believe this is it because they have a memorial in Ukraine, and that is the memorial. What do you think that is right there? It's an angel blowing the trumpet. They actually know and believe that Chernobyl was the third trumpet. So I'm not going to get into the rest. You guys can go watch that message if you've never seen it. And I have many more details in that than I'm giving you this morning. But what does that bring you to? So if I believe the five trumpets has happened, what's the next event? Go to Revelation 9. There is an event coming upon the world before Jesus comes. And it's not good. Revelation 9, and we're going to go down to verse 13. Everybody still with me? Yeah. It's, we're doing good. It's only 1140. We're doing pretty good. He says here, And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year. What for? To slay or kill the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, 200 million. And I heard the number of them, and thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and jacinth and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone, 
For by these three were the third part of men killed by the fire, by the smoke, and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. Um, this is uh, an interesting thing because it goes on to say, for the power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents, and they had heads with them, they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of their works. Now, this is what's interesting. This is going to happen, this war, it's called, we just, I just call it the Sixth Trumpet War, it's going to happen, and it's going to kill a third part of mankind. Now, that has to be, and it says by fire, so that has to be nuclear. It's the only way you're going to do that. Um, you have nuclear powers right there beside each other, China, India, Pakistan, Russia above them, India and China hate each other. And what's happened, though, recently is that Russia and China have become allies. And soon, we are going to be at war with both Russia and China. And the only way that we can maintain and survive as a nation is that there will have to be the use of nuclear weapons against China, or we will be overwhelmed by them. It's just a fact. Um, now, depending on who our president is, we may have a president that will not defend us and let it all happen. And we'll be invaded by China and Russia, and we'll be invaded on every side. And I think we're still going to be invaded to a degree, but depending on who our president is, is going to depend on how bad it actually turns out being for us. Um, but I want to show you something. I believe the Gog-Magog War and this Sixth Trumpet War, I believe they're one and the same, okay? And it's interesting because you're seeing Russia and this Ukraine issue, and then you're seeing Israel and Hamas and I Iran and Hezbollah and all this, but it's all tied together. Every bit of it's tied together, and it's happening now at the same time. Now, let's, let's go to... Uh, you to put up the the Russia speaker pictures. Now, normally I I actually sent Kelsey all this this morning, so she's doing she's doing really well. Now, the Russia Russia's House of Representatives is called the Duma, right? So their speaker said this. And we got, he says, top Russian, this is Jerusalem Post, top Russian lawmaker warns West of nuclear war over Ukraine. Senior Russian lawmaker on Thursday said the Ukrainian strikes on Russia with Western missiles would lead to global war with the use of nuclear weapons and that Moscow's response would be tough with more powerful weapons. Let's keep going. Now, I'm not even going to try to pronounce his first name, Vlodidin, or whatever, however you want to say it. He, the Speaker of Russia's Duma, the lower house of parliament, said that if the West gave permission for such strikes deep into Russian territory, then it would lead to global war with the use of nuclear weapons. And this just goes on to say what he's saying, and we'll go to the next one. And notice that Jerusalem Post understands the connection, because what they said, he was responding to a European parliament vote uh, in favor of letting uh, Kiev hit Russian targets with... Western weapons and said that Moscow's thought the West had forgotten about these sacrifices the USSR made in World War II. He even talked about how they lost 1.1 million in just the Battle of Stalingrad. And is there one more on this? All right. Put up the Russian ones there. Yeah. And you hear, here's the Jerusalem Post, Iran is what, backed by Russia, China, and North Korea, who don't want to lose their Iranian asset. He said, explaining that the U.S. will avoid getting involved in a war that could develop into a world war. So all of this, again, all of this is interconnected. Um, and they're talking about we, nuclear war. Now, we are closer to nuclear war than we've ever been, probably since the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis in the 60s. And here's what blows my mind. It's like most Americans are still walking around asleep in this daze, as if things are just gonna continue as they are 
forever. And you know that that's the attitude. Um, first, I mean, Second Peter 3, 1. Put that up there, the first chapter. I mean, uh, Second Peter just chapter 3, verse 1. We'll start there. I just want to read this real quick before we finish. Because I got somewhere to go with this. We're going to bring it in for a landing in a second. He said here, the second epistle, beloved, now I write unto you, in which both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. Now, this means people, scoffers mean people that just go, meh. They just, meh. And it says walking after their own lust. All that means is walking after their own desires. Now, this defines, I just want to tell you right now, this defines most of American Christianity. Because most churches won't even talk about the second coming. They won't even talk about end time prophecy. They give no warning of anything because it's all about how to deal with stress at work, how to feel good. It's cotton candy instead of what's really happening. And he said, Knowing this first, that in the last days, this is what's going to happen. Let me tell you, the church is full of these scoffers who walk after their own desires. This is not just the wicked. And then he says, saying, they're going to say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were. So they're going to say, oh, people have been talking about this for Decades, hundreds of years. Oh, they've been talking about the second coming of Jesus. It hadn't happened. Do you know there are many people, even Christians, talking like this? I hear this. I get sent messages and emails and social media comments about this. Ah, what are you talking about? This has been talked about forever. It's not a real literal coming. It's all spiritual. And all Revelation is is an allegory about the war with good and evil. And I'm like, you are just spewing the deceptions of Roman Catholic Church. And then he goes on to say, they say, where is the promise of his coming? All things just continue as they were, which means they're not paying attention. Go to the next one. And for this, they willingly are ignorant. Now, it's one thing to be ignorant. It's another thing to be willingly ignorant. That's a choice. It's like you have been delivered the information. And what's going on and what the Bible says and what's happening in the world. But you just like, "Mm -mm, I'm not, I'm not listening. Blah, blah. I've had people tell, I don't want to hear blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, well, that's not going to save you. Blah, blah, blah. You know what kids are like? You know, they think that if they, if, if you can't see them, you know, if they can't see you, you can't see them, right? (laughs) That's not going to work. The sword is coming upon the world like we have never seen before. And we must get ready. I want to show you this, this rabbi in, in Israel. This is just the other day. Now, he's going to be deceived by the Antichrist. He's going to follow the Antichrist as the Messiah. But it's interesting what he says here. The Jerusalem Post, notice... September 18th, so just a few days ago, mystical rabbi warns Gog and Magog war begins. Nations opposing Israel will die. And here's, you you want to know why he knows this? Because he reads Ezekiel. He's not having some mystical experience. He just knows Ezekiel, right? Let's keep going. It says, a mystical rabbi has warned that nations and leaders seeking to harm Israel will face divine retribution with floods, earthquakes, and other natural disasters signaling the beginning of the prophesied Gog-Magog war and the imminent arrival of the Messiah. Now, see, they know, what's interesting is the rabbis know from studying the Old Testament that these things have to happen before the Messiah comes. The problem is, is that they missed his first coming But they know that he's coming. This is why, because they rejected Jesus as the Messiah, they will be deceived by the false Messiah that comes first. Many of the Jews 
Many of the Israelites will be deceived and they will be destroyed for that because they are. But the Bible tells us in Zechariah, what? That many of them are going to turn to Jesus. Many of the Israelites, many of the Jews are going to turn to Jesus. And anybody out there that says that Israel, there's no Jews in Israel and you're, so, you're, you're just a complete whack job on saying that it's not even supposed to, Israel, there's no real nation of Israel, there's no real Jews. I mean, I hear this all the time. These are the goofer truthers out there that don't know the Bible, they don't understand history, and like I said, there's more than Ashkenazi Jews, there's Mizraki Jews, there's Ethiopian Jews, there's Sephardic Jews, there's all kinds. God brought them back to the land. Many of them are even now turning to Jesus and accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior and Messiah. And many more will in the days ahead. And that's why we should pray for them. Now, I'm not saying that everything the Israeli government does is good. Many of them are evil. Many of them are following the same evil satanic plan as our people in our government. But we don't say everybody does that anybody that whenever you start labeling a group it's like everybody's the same then you're not really discerning properly what's really going on um but as i've said before about israel but if it comes down if it's between israel and iran or any other muslim i mean when i talk about muslim i'm talking about practicing muslim nation where they are going to follow the quran and the hadith I'm going, to, I'm going to stand with Israel against that death cult. Islam is a death cult. They even say they love death. And they kill Christians and Jews. So these people running around, oh, Gaza. Y'all have no idea. I've been there. I was there when the first infatata started. I was there when the gunshots were flying in one street while you were on the other and people were having to be shot and killed. I was there. I walked up to, I'm not, I was talking to some people. I'm walking up to the Jerusalem bus station to get on a bus to go up to uh, Haifa. And I walk right here and I, boom, police, yellow police tape. And a guy, I know, and I kid you, he's right here where you are. He walks right in front of me, holding a bomb. He was a bomb squad guy. He had on full bomb squad, like the thick, heavy, you know, armor. And he walks into a bomb truck, and I, I actually looked and saw the bomb. That's how close I've been to a bomb, about right here. And he walked in the truck. Now, that bomb was to go on a bus in the Jerusalem bus station, which is one of the busiest bus stations you could ever go to, how many people would have been killed? So let me just go on and tell you, you can, you can be anti-Jew, anti-Israel all you want to be, but if it comes down to me having to pick where I, if I wanted to go, let me tell you something, if I had to pick between going to Israel or going to Iran, guess where I'm going? Israel. If I had to pick where I was going to live, so come on, let's stop being foolish here. We, we, we get the, let the media water our brains down on what these Muslims say. Oh, we're a religion of peace. There is nothing of a religion of peace about Islam. You obviously don't know what, they, what their Quran says and what the Hadith say. And you obviously don't know what, what Muhammad did. And it really, it boils down to this. What did Muhammad do? Because they teach that Muhammad is the best example to follow. That's what they teach. So what did Muhammad do? He killed Jews and Christians, made some Christians slaves. He beheaded Christians and Jews, and he also married a six-year-old girl named Aisha and consummated the marriage when she was nine, which is why you see child marriage in some of these Muslim countries. They're just following Muhammad. It's evil. And when his, he allegedly got contacted by Gabriel, he said whatever this entity was that contacted him, nearly strangled him and killed him, put him in miserable pain, his own mother thought he was demon-possessed. These are all facts, right? So don't even go down that road. You know, like Israel's not perfect, but Lord, I would rather go there. Hey, 
America's not perfect, but I'm glad that I was born here and that I live here. We got a lot of problems, but man, do we have a lot of blessings to be in this country. So let's not just stereotype these things, right? But I just wanted to point that out, that even this, even this rabbi, who they said is well-known and well-respected throughout Israel, is saying, this is the Gog and Magog War. This is what's about to unfold. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean for us? Well, see, here's what happened. Let me just break it down for you. In 2013, 2013, 2014 time period, the Obama and Biden with Soros, George Soros money, they, the people of, the, of Ukraine had elected a, a president that was pro-Russia, and this is all about energy. It's all about the natural gas. Ukraine is full of resources. Uh, most of the fertilizer that we need comes from there. Uh, a great portion of the wheat and grain and things that we need come from there. Um, but they came in, Obama and Biden and the State Department, and what I'll call the deep state, they made a plan to overthrow that president by a revolution. And they were successful. They overthrew the duly elected president of the Ukraine, who was pro-Russian, and put in their pro-American, pro-Western puppet. Now, this infuriated Vladimir Putin, as it would me, because what they began to do after that was put in a secret NATO headquarters, put in bioweapons labs, and start moving weapons in right on Russia's border. Now, the reason that this is important to Russia is, think about how America started, right? We, we, we can look back at Massachusetts, Plymouth, Plymouth Rock. I've been there, 1620. We think about Jamestown and Virginia and all of that stuff like there. Think about another nation coming in and saying, we're just going to take over this area here that was the beginning of your country. What would you do? What do you think we would do? See, I don't think Vladimir Putin is as evil as a lot of people make out that he is. I think he is pro-Russia, which as the leader of Russia, he ought to be. I wish we had a president that was pro-America, right? We did at one time for four years. Hopefully we'll get one for four more. But isn't that, a, isn't that a marvel? So Vladimir Putin is angry about this. And he said that this was a red line. And another thing that we promised him from Clinton on, they promised no more expansion of NATO countries being brought into NATO along the border of Russia. No more of those Eastern Bloc, formerly Soviet satellite countries to be, we would, that we would not bring any more of them in. And guess what we did? And that was Clinton, the Bush family. Is, let me just go and tell y'all, the Bush family, one of the most evil families in this world. I know that just burns some Republicans up because you don't understand that this, this evil is on both sides, okay? And some of these people don't care. And, of course, Bush continued it, but W continued it into Iraq and Afghanistan, and there was no need to go into either of those places. We, we found out that that was all a lie, right? Um, and that's why I love, look, I love President. You know, pre, isn't it amazing that it's a Republican president that doesn't want war? You know why? Because we're used to these satanic, Illuminati, cabal, neocon Republicans that want to go to war with everybody and try to take over and manipulate the world. If we would just leave things alone, if we would have left the Ukraine alone, there wouldn't be a Ukrainian war. It's our fault. It's the United States policies of, 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 from Obama and Biden. And why do you, so why do you think once Biden gets in, boom, we're in war? And then there's all this propaganda, right? That's why Trump said if I was there, it would, there would be peace. Why? Because Trump would pull everything out of there. 
Trump would pull out our weapons and all the deception and not try to push them into NATO and let them do what they want with their country. Vladimir Putin is there because they've been poking the bear. They've been provoking the bear because these evil satanic cabal people want World War III. They want it. I love these people who think they're so enlightened about the, you know, the, uh, what's his name? The Freemason, Morals and Dogma. Why is his name gone? Albert Pike. They go about this prediction of the three world wars. Guess what? That's not some revelation that the Freemasons had and just decided this is what we're going to do. They knew the Bible said we were going to have three world wars. And the Bible told us that the third one, the last one, would be between, it would start between Israel and the Arab nations. This is not a revelation. The, Albert Pike got some kind of Freemason plan that they planned three wars. It's been in the Bible all along. These occultists, these high-level occultists, they know what's in the Bible. Satan knows what's in the Bible. And he tries to plan accordingly, to get everybody distracted from what's actually in here. But folks, let me just go ahead and tell you right now, the war is coming, and it will go nuclear. Now, one thing, I know people, there's people out there who believe the lie that, the, that nuclear weapons are a hoax. This is not true. One thing they have lied about, though, is how long the radiation problem lasts. They have lied about that. It's not as long, and it doesn't last as long as they've told us. And there's also a new type of, I guess you would call it nuclear, it's called a, uh, a neutron bomb, which a neutron bomb is pretty powerful, but doesn't leave the radiation that a, a traditional nuclear weapon uses. But Vladimir Putin and his people just warned, and he's under a lot of pressure because they, his hardliners in their government are saying that he's being soft and letting, letting NATO control this whole thing. So the point's going to come that either they're going to assassinate Putin and put in somebody that's going to do what needs to be done, what they think needs to be done, which is go full on, or Putin's going to have to do it at some point. And he's let, he let the European Parliament know that our newest Sarmat nuclear missiles can reach you in three minutes. He told them this. Three minutes, that's all you'll have. He said he will hit London. He will hit Washington, D.C. And let me tell you, anybody remember in the early 80s? I think it was 1980 even, may have been. The movie War Games. Remember that? Does anybody remember the end result of the computer running the program of the United States and Russia going to nuclear war? What was it? The, nobody wins. Which is what has kept us from a major nuclear war. It's called mutually assured destruction. But what I believe is I don't believe we're going to see full-scale nuclear war, but we're going to see some nukes hit. I don't, you've got to understand that China and Russia don't want to fully destroy the United States, especially the middle of the country where they can use it to grow food. And that's why China is very interested in our farmland. And they don't have, they don't have enough to feed their people. And so they're looking for more and more places to do that. So we are in the midst of something that's not going to stop. It's not going to turn around. And we may get a delay like we did last time. But this is coming. And the Lord let me know, I must warn you. Because what's gonna, what do you think is going to happen when the first nuclear bomb goes off again? What do you think is going to happen to the United States stock market? Mm -hmm. What do you think is going to happen to the ability to ship oil from overseas to here? Or fertilizer? Or grain? You know, what's interesting is the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which tells another story. The black horse, it says, there is what? 
a measure of wheat for a penny or a denarii, a measure of barley. That, at the time when he wrote that, a denarii or a penny was a day's wages for a measure of wheat or barley, he said. A day's wages. Now, the Bible so specific And we're seeing what is called UG99 stem rust and other issues starting to destroy the wheat and barley. And let me just go on and tell you right now, I know farmers are talking about right now that they cannot get the fertilizer that they need. And the World Economic Forum and the United Nations 2030 Agenda and Agenda 21, all of that is about taking over those farms making us eat, you know, lab-created meat and bugs. They said it all this because of, you know, the cow farts are causing global warming. Isn't it? I mean, you know what that is right there. That's just, that's what they call gaslighting, isn't it? <laughs> Anybody that believe that cow farts are a problem, for mankind, is, is, and that they would say this in a serious, like, serious, try to tell us that that's, we've, we've got to get rid of farms and you can't eat meat because cow farts are a problem. I'm going to tell you why they don't want us to eat meat, because that's how, the only way you're going to survive. Meat has everything you need. The vegetarians have been wrong all along. I'm sorry, but y'all have been wrong. Meat has the minerals, it has the vitamins, it has the fat that you have to have to survive, that it has to have for your brain. Plants, there is not the same kind of fat in any kind of plant for your brain, and this is all fact. And here's what happens. If you don't have meat and good protein in you from meat and that fat, you actually begin to not be able to think correctly. It actually begins to to affect your mind. It weakens you. And this is why they don't want to. They don't want us to have guns. They don't want us to be able to hunt. They don't want us to be able to defend ourselves. All of this is the World Economic Forum, UN agenda. And everything you hear, Kamala and these Democrats, whenever they talk about gun control, whenever they talk about environmental, you know, climate change, all of they are talking is the satanic United Nations agenda for the world. And the United Nations is... The seven-head, ten-horned beast of Revelation. And I've proved that before. But it is. And soon, when they get ready, and they're going to do this, they're going to change the rules of the Security Council and take away the veto power. And once they take a veto, the veto power away from the five permanent members, then that's when, and they because they want it to be just by vote of the nations, like majority. They See, we're not a democracy, folks, right? But they want the United Nations to be a democracy, basically majority rule. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen to all these nations that are anti-United States once they get to vote? What do you think the direction of the UN is going to be? Yeah. So we have these things coming. We have the red horse of war is going to be here pretty soon, and it's going to touch our country. You say, well, Pastor Dean, what do I need to do? I'm going to give you a few things, and we're going to be done. Actually, I'm going to be done kind of early today. I normally go for an hour and a half, but it's just a little over an hour now. Here's what you need to do. We need to pray. You need to make sure you have a prayer life like you've never had before. You need to fast frequently. You need to fast. You need to pray for our country, for our world, for each other, for the unsaved people around you. So you need to pray like you've never prayed before. You need to know the Bible. You need to study the Bible and get it in you. Because you need to be prepared to face possible martyrdom in the days ahead. Are you going to be ready for that moment? So you've got to make sure you know the word of God. And you've got to make sure that you've repented and that you are in a good place, you're walking with Jesus in obedience and holiness and righteousness. Because we don't know, it could be in a moment, in a flash of light. 
and we're in eternity. So you better make sure you're truly born again, that Jesus is Lord of your life, that you're not playing. Now, I want to I go to this verse. I'm sorry, one more verse. The Lord gave me this one this week, and it's in Galatians chapter 6. I want to read this. Galatians 6. And this ought to be familiar to everybody. Verse 9, he says this. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now, we read over these things. And sometimes we don't look up the words, but put up the word I gave you for the definition of weary in the Greek here. The definition of weary, this is your Thayer's Greek lexicon. Look at that, what it means to be utterly spiritless, to be exhausted, to lose courage. Now, spiritless, what does that mean? It's like a, a soldier who loses his will to fight. This is what he's warning about. We're going to see such things coming upon the world. We're going to be faced with such difficulties and persecution and all kinds of things. We're going to be facing these things. And we're either going to be full of the Holy Spirit and have a strong spirit and be diligent in our relationship with God and so we can be faithful to God or we're going to faint. We're going to lose courage. Now, that's what it says, let us not grow weary that's the, that's the Greek word for weary there. All right? Now let's look at faint not. If we faint not, notice this, this is important. To despond or become faint-hearted, here we go, the, the, the Strong's Concordance Greek Dictionary, to relax. Oh! He's talking about relaxing, loosening up, Moving away from your intensity for the Lord. You got to stay, you got to keep your intensity. What is the, look up despondent. What does despondent mean? Despondent means a feeling or showing ex extreme discouragement, dejection, depression. So he's telling us here don't let this happen to you, but continue. Doing the right thing, doing good things. That's why I'm telling you. Prayer, fasting, studying the word, repenting, making sure everything's right with the Lord. Making sure, because there's no such thing as once saved, always saved. You're not going to just live in sin and think it's, everything's going to be okay. You have to truly repent and turn from sin. As my old pastor used to say, admit it and quit it. That's repentance. It's not confess it and keep doing it. That's not repentance. Amen? The other thing you need to do, and I've said this many times, I'm going to say it again. I said it last Sunday. You better make some physical preparations. You know, we have a, we, we live kind of out in the country, but my, I inherited my great-grandfather's house, and a long time ago, they pay extra. We actually pay still to have a street light right in front of my driveway. We had to pay for that. Let me tell you one time, the power was out completely in our whole long stretch of our road there. It was so dark out there in my front yard. I'm, I'm so not used to this because that street light's always on at night. I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. You better have some good flashlights. You better have light source for your house in case the power is out. You better have extra food. And I'm not talking about just some canned food from the grocery store. I'm talking about some stuff that lasts a few years. I'm telling you to do this. Why am I telling you to do this? See, they always said that the preppers are crazy folks. But it's interesting because... For instance, a few years ago, we knew someone who was a special forces doctor who became an astronaut. 
That's how deep into it he is. And he was telling his family, ah, you know, what, are you, what are y'all prepping for? He was laughing at them because part of his family came to our church, and he was laughing and laughing it up. Why are y'all prepping? Why do you worry about any of that stuff? And then one day they were at his house and happened to go down in his basement and found out he was prepped out. You see? People who have certain security clearances, they know what's coming. And how many of you know, that, know this, that the other day that there was a dirty bomb that was set to go off at the Trump rally in New Jersey? And they found it. The drug-sniffing bomb found it. Anybody hear about that? <laughs> yeah, the media made sure that they did not share that with you because they plan on doing it again soon and making it work. Y'all know what a dirty bomb is? Anybody know what a dirty bomb is? Okay, a few of you. That's just a conventional bomb that has nuclear radioactive material in it that spreads that. Some people at a Trump rally in uh, Tucson were poisoned by some kind of gas. About 20 were injured. These attacks on President Trump are going to continue. They want him dead because they think he's going to overwhelm the cheating in the voting machines and all the other cheating that they're going to do. They're afraid that he is going to become the president of the United States and be a thorn in their globalist agenda. And with all his faults and all his issues, he will be that. I know there's people out there that think Trump is part of the whole thing, but he's not. And the Lord told me that he was not in 2016. So again, prophetically, that's what I'm to tell you. And you can not like him all you want to, but God's hand is upon him and told me in 2016 that he would, it was God's will for him to be president, that his hand was upon him, that the Lord said, I will turn his heart toward me, is what he told me. And then he said, it'll be better for you. And he used the word in tribulation if he's president. He didn't say Trump was saved. He didn't say Trump was some holy man. He didn't say he's some savior, Messiah. He said we, it would be better for us. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of good with better. I, I can take better. Right? I can take mean tweets and better. Right? We need to pray for him because they are trying to kill him. But actually, it's a good sign them trying to kill him because that means they think he's going to win. And actually, a uh, guy has the, um, that does the Socrates computer program said that the, really the support in America for Trump is 90% to 10 for Kamala. That's the real numbers. But they're giving you these fake polls out there so that you will think this is close so they can cheat that much. And you won't notice it. But if they cheat this time like that, that drastically, that much, we're going to be in a situation like Venezuela. Because that's exactly what just happened in Venezuela. So, let's get prepared. Let's pray for our country, for God's mercy and intervention. He's told me we are going to get hit, but that he is not going to allow a full end to be made of our country. That the Lord is going to intervene, and I think to the degree that we pray and repent is the degree to which he will intervene for us and have mercy. There's a lot of Christians still in America, and God has a purpose for us all the way to the end. Amen? Amen. That's why he said, what? Endure to the end. So, let's stand. Y'all think y'all can handle three more minutes? Let's do that last song. Let me pray first. Father, thank you for your word and your warning, God. And as uh, your watchman, I have warned that the sword is coming upon the land, that America will be hit. The war is coming in the Middle East and throughout Europe and Russia. 
the Arab nations, it's coming. Lord, you foretold it, and it's not you doing it. It's evil people doing it. And a lot of people wonder, why do you allow it? Lord, you're going to come one day soon and put a stop to all this evil. But you warned us, you told us in the last days, great tribulation. Nations would be against nation. People against people. Ethnic group against ethnic group. You told us there would be such upheaval that men's hearts would fail them for fear looking at the things coming upon the world. But we're not going to let our hearts faint or become weary. We're not going to become spiritless or relax our intensity for you and for the truth and for being a witness to people around us. Lord, we thank you that there are such specifics in the Bible and Bible prophecy that it is a testimony that the Bible is the inspired, infallible word that you gave us. We love you, we worship you, and Lord, we want you to have our heart, our whole heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's do it. Lord, you have my heart, and I will search for you. Jesus, take my life and lead me on. Oh, Lord, you have my heart, and I will search for yours. Let me be to you a sacrifice, and I will pray. promised in Isaiah 60 that though darkness would cover the earth and gross darkness the people that Lord you would arise upon your people and your glory would be seen upon your people Lord we know that's a reference to these last days Lord that you're going to pour out your spirit on all flesh there is going to be a revival many are going to come you have raised us up Lord to instruct many to lead many into righteousness and repentance and faith in you. Help us be a light and a witness. Help us share these prophecies of your second coming. Let us share your gospel, that you died on that cross for our sins and rose from the dead, that you are the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus, the only one. 
that can wash sins away, the only one that can give eternal life. We worship you, we exalt you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, somebody praise the Lord real quick. Give the Lord a prayer. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I don't know about you. I mean, some people, I think some of these things, you start talking about it, freak some people out. But, you know, I'd rather, with me, and I think there's a lot of people, I'd rather know what's coming and brace myself and prepare for it the best I can, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, financially, every way try to prepare myself, then to it catch me off guard. I, I mean, I don't want that. So I, don't, I, I really don't understand folks that don't want to know, that don't want to understand what's coming. But uh, we live in a different time now. You know, even, even 50 years ago, 50 years ago, the things the Bible said about the last days would have been impossible. We had to have the Internet. We had to have smaller microchips and things. Like that. That's the only way we have the mark of the beast. So people who were saying that Jesus could come at any moment, they were not telling the truth. Because even Paul said there are things that have to happen, and then it will come. And part of that, the mark of the beast, the mark of the beast is before the second coming, before the rapture of the church. And that hasn't happened ever. And it couldn't happen until now. The use of the Internet and computers and small microchips in somebody's hand or forehead, being able to be scanned and read from outside to put health information, banking information, that is now a reality. So when people say all things are the same as they always were, that's a person that has no idea what's really going on. We are at the point where every single prophecy is either com they're come to pass already or in the process of it. Even the drying up the Euphrates, when the Turks... The Turkish government built the Ataturk Dam. Guess what they can do? The moment they, they can shut off the Euphrates River and it drives up downstream. That's already ready for the armies of the east to pass over. There's so many prophecies that are just ready to go. So don't let people deceive you. Don't lose your intensity. What did Jesus talked about the parable of the faithful servant, and he said, the unfaithful servant said, my Lord delayeth his coming. I can do whatever I want. Don't want to have that attitude. Amen? Amen. All right. Y'all know the, the drill. Hug some necks before you leave. We'll give one more Skyfall. October 25th through the 27th. Go to skyfallconference.org. Register, pick your lunches for Friday and Saturday. We're going to have those brought in. And uh, get ready for a great time of praise and worship and teaching. And there's going to be some things that, some new stuff that we haven't talked about uh, coming forth. So it's going to be a good, good time of information and inspiration. We're going to get both. Amen? All right. Well, again, hugs of next before you leave. We'll say bye to everybody out there.